productive and do more in less time. So that's just the essence of using thin car writing tools. So now what are the types of technical writing tools? We have different types of technical writing tools. I'm going to touch on different aspects like search engine optimization tools. I'm going to talk about productivity tools. Now I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the number of tools I'll be talking about. Each and every one of them are used at different areas of your writing. Some of them you would use them, some of them you may not use them. It's for you to also be aware of the different kinds of tools you can use. So now for types of technical writing, did you know that we have different types of tools for different purposes? Now this is where it gets interesting. The first part we'll be talking about is grammar. Now many of us, we write our articles, our documentation in our language, and for some of us here, we use the English language. And you know, when you're writing, as a writer, one of the things that is really frowned upon is grammatical blunder or even typography errors. So if we have to talk about grammar, we need tools that would help us with our, sorry about that. So we need tools that will help us for when it comes to grammar. So technical writing requires use of grammar and language. So we need to write and call documents in the correct use of grammar. Now, grammar tools, what they use is that they help you to identify your spelling errors, punctuation errors, and syntax errors, just to correct them for you. Now, the first aspect is Grammarly. Grammarly is actually a popular tool, it's very popular, that people use to check grammatical errors, to enhance your writing quality, and to ensure that you know your your content is okay, it's informative, it's educative, and it's engaging. And your writing style conforms to whether it's the British or the American style. Now, when it comes to Grammarly, Grammarly helps you to check your spelling errors, and it works as an extension, whether it's your web browser, if it's Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, anyone that it is. I'm sorry, if you are dropping questions in chat, I can't see it yet because I'm sharing my my screen fully. So I'll check questions after explaining everything, but you can drop your questions in the chat. So for Qbot now, Qbot is a grammar checker, but it's not just a grammar checker, it helps to paraphrase um, words. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Victoria. Can yes? You? Sorry. I don't think your, your, your slide is moving. We are still just in the cover image of the slide. Oh, I've actually changed my slide. Okay, let me let me stop sharing and try to share again. Okay. Yeah. Okay, can you see it now? Um. Yes. Yes, we can now. You can see it on grammar. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. So for QBot, I was saying that QBot is very useful for reducing plagiarism and also checks grammar. It's just that it's not as accurate as Grammarly. Sometimes QBot gives very, very unnecessary suggestions for grammar, but it's still very useful. Now we'll be talking about plagiarism. Now, when it comes to academic writing or technical writing, plagiarism is the practice of taking someone else's work and then passing them off as your own. So imagine you find an article that talks about maybe technical documentation or API documentation. It will not make any sense for you to pick off every single thing that that person wrote and then put it in your, maybe your medium on your, or your ash node and then say it's yours. It's actually wrong. Another aspect of plagiarism is that some of us, we actually, we are writing an article and then you are reading from different sites. Unconsciously, sometimes we pick up what we read and then we are writing. We pick up the exact same words from these sites that we read, which is still wrong. So it's very useful to use plagiarism tools to check if by chance some of the sites that you um, researched on, maybe you use the exact same words or the similarity is very close. So we have different kinds of plagiarism tools. We have Dupli Checker. 
Now, Duplichecker is just duplichecker.com. As you can see there, hello. It's, um, can you see my screen? Hello. Please, please don't, don't interrupt. Sorry to cut you off. You are in the last slide. You are not in the uh, plagiarism slide. Wow. Okay, let me try to share again. Victoria, can you share your entire window? Not just this window. So it's easier to just know Okay, all right. I think this should be better again. How about now? I need to the plagiarism slide now. Yes. Okay, so I think I'll just leave it here. I want to put this in the slideshow so that we can all see it. Okay, so I was talking about Dupli Checker, and I said with Dupli Checker, you can just go to duplichecker.com and then you can copy and it provides a box. You can copy and paste the text, and then it would let you know the plagiarism percentage, whether it's 1% or 3% or 100%. Now, if you check the technical documentation for Tech Car Writing Mentorship Program, you would get more information on this, and you would see the picture of how it looks. Then we have Qtext. Now, for Qtext, Qtext is used by not just writers, but even academics. It's mostly used for school um, to check plagiarism. But the thing about Qtext is that it offers like 500 words for free, and they have extensive databases for you to search online for plagiarized content. Sorry. Then we have plagiarism detector. Now, this one is also accurate and it's free. So we are going to ask the question, what actually differentiates these tools from each other? Now, one of them is their features. The, they are free version. Some of them offer 1,000 words at once, 500 words at once. And some of them, when it comes to their paid versions, they have more features. You can check as much as 25,000 words. But for DupliCheckr, it offers 1,000 words. So let's say you wrote a 3,000 word article, you would have to you know, copy and paste three times for you to be able to check the plagiarism for each aspect. So now we're talking about authoring tools. So when you are creating technical documentation or you are writing articles, I'm going to ask yourself, where do I put all of this content? How do I compile this content in one place? where I can add my text, I can add my images, I can format it the way I want, I can add bold, I can add you know, bullet points and many more, and then also give it headings. This is where authoring tools comes in place. So with authoring tools, you can write your text, you can add images and compile your content in one place. Can we also see my screen? Can I see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Thank you. So for now, when it comes to authoring tools, we have Google Docs, we have Microsoft Word, we have Notepad, and we have Evernote. I'm very sure that some of us are already using some of these tools. When it comes to Google Docs now, Google Docs, as we know, is built by Google for you to create and edit your documents. The very big like advantage of google docs is that you can access it anywhere so let's say you're writing an article on your pc and you have to go out and you want to continue you can continue it on your mobile app with the google docs app and it's also very useful for team-based projects so let's say we have like two to three people that want to contribute to an article each and every one of them can have like the editor access and they can impute their edits they can even also add comments to it. And you can see versions and changes of what people have done on the documents so far. And that one is Microsoft Word. Now, Microsoft Word is a web, mobile, and desktop application that you can use to create an edit document. As we know, it's built by Microsoft. It also allows you to save documents on the cloud using OneDrive. 
and you can access it anywhere. And one thing about Microsoft Word is that it allows you to add things like images, your flow charts. You can create the style as you want, the font size, the font type. You can bold and italize as you want. Then we have Notepad. Now, if you use Windows, I'm sure you would have been using Notepad constantly. It's just for Windows. And you can write and edit your programs. You can write and edit just simple documents as you want. It's just that Notepad is not as flexible or as extensive as Google Docs and Microsoft Word. Notepad just allows you to add text. You cannot add images. You can't format as you want. Then we have Evernote. Evernote is just a tool to, you know, you can jot down ideas. It's user friendly and it's available for Android, iOS, Windows, and Mac. So you can even create notes from images and photos. Now, each of these tools have their features. Microsoft Word, you can have it on desktop application where it's a local file. With Google Docs, you use Gmail accounts. Notepad is free and it's for Windows. And Evernote is mostly used by entrepreneurs, executives, and creatives. We want something much more complex or like a business. So you choose the tool based on what you want or what you like, and also the interface that you feel is more friendly, along with the features that you like. If you are writing an article that requires images, you definitely would not choose Notepad, but Notepad will not allow you to add images. So let's move on. Now, we'll be talking about image tools. If you're writing articles, I'm very sure many of us would have seen a lot of articles and documentation online. Now, each and every one of these tools, each and every one of these articles, sorry, they have images. I'm very sure that when you see image, images in articles, you would, it just builds that appeal, like visually stunning images gives you that appeal when there, is, there are images that are beautiful, that points more to what um, you're explaining. So that's one of the reasons we need to use image tools. So for Photoshop, Photoshop is actually a complex tool. If you are someone that are used to the Adobe family, Photoshop is something you can use to create images easily. Then we have Anotly. Now, this one is just anotly.com. Let's say you have an article that you want to point an attention in the article to your readers or your users. You want to maybe like point an arrow, like install in Chrome, or you want to add numbers, you want to explain one, two, three, four, five. With Anotly, you can easily do things like that. Anotly gives you option to add arrows, to add numbers, and even blur. Let's say you have something in the screenshot that you don't want them to see, maybe like your tabs or your image from the screenshot, you can blow it on Anotly. Now we have designer. So I'm very sure some of us, when we write articles, we would like to have like a cover photo for maybe Instagram, LinkedIn, or even the blog post. So with designer and Canva and Photoshop, you can easily create designs and graphics. Now the way designer works is that it works like ChatGPT like prompts, it uses prompts. So like designer, for example, you can just say, create a professional design on my writing services, use maybe purple and white as brand colors, use 1920 times 1080 pixels. You can even specify the, the size that you want and then you can generate it and it will give you designs. The Microsoft designer is quite simple. If you want something very simple and not complex, designer is your go-to software to easily create cover photos. If you are not a graphic designer and you cannot hire one, you can use designer to just generate user-friendly, simple, beautiful images for your LinkedIn, your Instagram, your TikTok, your blog posts, and many more. Same goes for Canva. Now, Canva is also a graphic design tool. But the thing about Canva is that Canva has inbuilt templates, very, very beautiful, lovely templates that you can use as cover photos for your social media applications. So now moving on, we'll be talking about integrated development environment tools. Now these are IDEs. 
Now, IDEs are software applications that we use to write codes. They are simply source code editors. Now, you're going to be asking me the question, how does IDE relate to technical writing? Now, technical writing involves writing software documentation, and some of them even require writing in languages like Markdown. If you want to publish an article or something to GitHub, most times they can be in, they are mostly in .md file. Some of them are in .md, which is Markdown. Now, you need to be able to write this documentation in Markdown. So that's where GitHub comes in. That's where this ID is coming. So they are suitable for GitHub, and you can use these IDs to even publish to GitHub directly. Now, some of them that we have, we have Visual Studio Code, which is VS Code. We have Notepad++, and we have Sublime Text. Now, I'm very sure some of us have heard of VS Code before. Now, VS Code is a code editor that was built by Microsoft. So the thing about VS Code is VS Code is very, very extensive. It allows you to, maybe it has a marketplace for extension. So with that extension, you can download a lot of integration apps. You can download Markdown. You can download a lot of programming languages that will be supported with VS Code. So it has a robust platform and you can integrate apps and software. So with VS Code, you can write languages in Markdown, Java, JavaScript, Python, PHP, Laravel, and so on. Now, the very, a very sweet part of VS Code is, is that it shows you a live preview of your code. So let's say you're writing in Markdown. Can we hear me? Can you hear me? Please confirm that you can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So with VS Code, it shows you a live preview. So let's say I write in Markdown, for example, and then I'm writing the code. I can see the way it would look, maybe like when I publish it to GitHub. That's one very important aspect of VS Code. Now we have Notepad. Notepad++ is much simpler when you're writing code, but it's, um, it's much more, is used mostly for Windows. It's not really um, good for Mac. Now, Notepad++ supports different programming languages like Markdown, but it's not as extensive as VS Code in giving you like a marketplace for integrations. Neither does it really provide that live preview. Then we have Sublime Text. Now, Sublime Text is a sophisticated code editor. It's also very simple. And the interface is also, it's not complex. Next, we'll be looking at screen capture tools. So remember, we talked about image tools, and we said it's very beautiful when you have images in your articles or in your documentation. Now, screen capture tools will help you to capture images and videos to add to your write-ups so that your users can understand where you're writing better. So technical writing requires videos and pictures. And some of these pictures actually would enhance user engagement and you know, enable you to capture these images. Now we have Snipe Tool, we have Snagit, and we have Loom. So for Snipe Tool, Snipe Tool is good for it works on Windows and you can easily screenshot or capture your screen, whether you want to capture your screen as a video or as an image. Then we have Snagit. Now, Snagit is a software application that we use to record screen on Windows. Now, Snagit doesn't just work for Windows. It works for Mac OS. That's the only difference it has with Snipe tool. Another thing is that Snagit is actually a paid tool. It's mostly used by businesses, organizations, teams, and individuals. But they offer a trial license for like 15 days for you to access the tool. Then we have Loom. So let's say you wrote an article and you want to record your screen or a video showing the article and explaining the article, maybe just for social media engagement, or able to be aware that you wrote something like that. You can use Loom. It works as a Chrome extension and you can use it to record, edit, and share videos. It's very user-friendly and it's easy. 
it's free but only for a few minutes i think five minutes and it's available as a desktop application both on mac os and windows so if you're someone that uses windows and you want to take screenshots snap tool is something you can easily use if you want to create videos just capture your screen you can use loom now let's talk about video tools what you can use to create videos let's say you're someone that you want people to know that you're writing you have information or you have knowledge about let's even use technical writing tools as an example now we have technical writing tools we've talked about video now we're talking about video tools we've talked about screen capture tools so with these video tools you can just create short videos maybe for youtube shorts for tiktok and many more just to show that yes you are a pro in technical writing now an example is InShots. InShots is useful for mobile devices works as a mobile app that you can use to create videos for social media engagements then we have CapCut. for CapCut, CapCut is useful for windows for mac for android and it even works on browsers. And I don't know if you know, but CapCut is actually the official editing tool for TikTok. It's very user-friendly, and you can use it to create content to upload on your social media handles like Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Another thing about CapCut is CapCut has more advanced features than InShots when it comes to transitions, designs, templates, and animations. Then we have Premiere Pro. So let's say you want to create a very complex video. <laughs> I'm sorry, but when it comes to the Adobe family, it's, they mostly have like complex tools. So Premiere Pro is more professional when you want to create very professional videos or to showcase your write-ups or to talk about your write-ups. The next aspect we'll be talking about is publishing sites. Now, publishing sites, they are very useful to post your articles, your documentation. They can even be used as writing samples. So we have WordPress, we have Madcap Flare, and we have Medium. There are many more, but these are the three we'll be talking about. So let's talk about WordPress now. I don't know if you've heard about WordPress, but you can react if you've heard of WordPress and if you've used it before. So WordPress is actually a publishing site that allows users to build websites. They're actually known as content management systems, and they allow you to create even things as little as blogs. You can easily publish your content with WordPress. Now, WordPress is open source. It's free, though there are some features that they are paid. You have to pay for them. But it's very flexible, especially if you don't have a knowledge of coding and you want to own like a blog as a technical writer so that you know people can know that yes you are an expert in this field next we have madcap flare madcap flare please confirm if you can hear me can you hear me yes thank you all right so we have madcap flare now it's very useful for publishing documentation knowledge bases user guides and user manual. And this one is very professional. You can use it on the web, on desktop, and even learning management systems like LMS. So the interface is very easy to use and it's user friendly. So that's one difference that Smart Capflare has with WordPress. WordPress is more like you can use it to build sites. You can use it to build blogs. You can use it for Main things that you want to do for Matt Capflay, you can use it for knowledge bases and you can even use it for LMS. Then we have Medium. Now, Medium is a free and easy to use platform for you to publish. In fact, if you are starting out as a technical writer, as a beginner, Medium is one of the best tools that you can use to publish your content. And the reason, firstly, is because you know it's free and also because. When it comes to Medium, if you write on Medium, let's say someone searches something relating to your content, it would actually, Google would actually bring it up to those users. 
So it's very useful for you to share ideas, engage with content, and even learn from other writers. Then we have portfolio websites. Now portfolio websites, what they do is that they help you to showcase your work to get writing gigs or jobs. Let's assume you are applying for a job as a tech car writer and they ask for writing samples. It's very useful to have a website that acts as your portfolio that you can submit to this application that you can show to your prospective clients. Now this is where Linktree, Wix, Clippings, and Consent are coming. So for Linktree, Linktree is a popular tool that allows you to, it actually acts like a landing page for your social media handles and resume. So how Linktree works is that you can add links to your social media pages, your LinkedIn, you can add a link to your resume, which can be on Google Docs. You can add links to your GitHub, you can add links to your WhatsApp, your Instagram, and your Facebook, and it's free. You can even add links to your Medium and Ashnode. It's always advisable to add links to things like your resume, your GitHub, and your blog sites for further information to these clients that you are submitting applications to. Then we have Wix. Wix is just like WordPress. It's also a content management system that allows you to build portfolio websites and showcase your work. Now, another advantage of Wix is that you can build your websites without having coding experience. You are this kind of person that you don't know like deep, as deep parts of coding like JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and PHP, and you want to build your site. You want to have a website that you can add as your portfolio, which is one very good tool that you can use. It has inbuilt templates that you can use to edit. So when you work with Wix, you can just tell it that, oh, you want to build a writing portfolio. It will give you templates, and with these templates, you can customize it to your choice. Another thing is Wix even has an AI tool that can be used to generate pages, generate sections, like your About Me, your services, and many more. Then we have clippings. For clippings, clippings is just like link tree. You can add links to your portfolio. Then we also have Consenter. Consenter also works as a browser extension. So when it comes to tools like this, choosing tools when it comes to portfolio websites, you can choose based on flexibility and what you want. So for something like Linktree, Linktree is very easy to create. All you just have to do is Google Linktree and you can just add the links directly and choose the thing that you want. For Wix, Wix is something more professional, like a website. And since it's free, if you can dedicate time to building a site on Wix, just generate the template and then edit it to what you want, you can use Wix. If you want clippings, clippings is also, the user interface is also nice. You can just easily add links. If you just know that, oh, you want to be submitting links to your website, you can use clippings and consenter. But for weeks, you can add pages that would add your work experience. You can add documents. You can add more complex things, more information that you can submit for applications. Then we have static site generators. Now, when it comes to static site generators, they are used to host and build technical documentation. I'm very sure some of us, we've seen programming languages like JavaScript, React, and Python, and they have their official documentation. Now, these documentation are actually built with these static site generators. Now, each and every one of these static site generators, they are written in different languages. So you can choose based on the language that you're comfortable with or you like or that is easy for you to learn. So we have Ugo. Ugo is actually used to optimize web pages and it's actually written in Go, that's like Golang. So we are good with Golang. Ugo is like your choice for building technical documentation. Then we have Sphinx. Now with Sphinx, Sphinx is more like a Python document. 
It's also used to create documentation. And if you are comfortable with Python, you can use strings. Then we have Gatsby. Gatsby, you can, it's actually a progressive web app static generator, and it's optimized to load HTML, CSS, JavaScript pages. And one feature of Gatsby is that it has an increased set of position. Next, we have MacDocs. Now, MacDocs supports building HTML pages. MacDocs uses Markdown language. A Markdown language is quite easy, and MacDocs is one very useful documentation tool. If you want to create things like Python, like, like JavaScript, and Golang. So that's it about static site generators. I'm talking about search engine optimization tools next, SEO tools. Now, when it comes to SEO, how many of us, when you write an article and you see that when you search, this joy you get when you write an article and it ranks among the first few pages of Google. So that means that, yes, when people Search on something relating to that. It's your article that they are going to find, and that would increase your audience, that would increase people that know what you do. So, we have the ranking of your website on search engines. We have SEMrush, we have Keyword So Far, we have Google Analytics. We have, so now, SEMrush is a very popular SEO tool that um, is very extensive for search engine optimization. Now, one thing about SEMrush is that they are offer uh, um, features for you to analyze your computer's traffic. They will give you like keyword research, the keywords you can use to ensure that your website ranks or your content ranks. They would also show you insights on how you can improve your website to ensure it ranks. Semrush also offers courses on search engine optimization. So what they offer keyword research, and many more. Then we have Keyword So Far. Now, Keyword So Far is free. It also provides keywords that you can use in your article for it to run. So Keyword So Far acts as a Chrome extension. So if you install the Chrome extension, anything you search at all, Keyword so far will give you the keywords relating to that content. So you can pick up keywords and then add it in your article. Though you should avoid stuffing keywords unnecessarily in the content. But yes, keyword so far is very useful. Though the fact that it's free, sometimes it doesn't provide information, but it's still useful. Then we have Google Analytics. So one thing that Google Analytics does is that it will provide you statistics and information when people are connected to your websites and mobile apps. So let's say you have a website now, and Google Analytics can give you information on how many people are reading the article, whether they are accessing it on mobile or working on your website. It will give you information about you. I'm very sure some of us, when we are writing, we get distracted. <laughs> some of us, maybe it's even procrastination that affects us while we are writing. So some of these tools help you to save time and to increase your writing performance generally. So now we take notes or even store and organize ideas. How many of us sometimes, we have ideas on what we want to write about and because we just didn't jot them down, we forget. So these are some of the tools you can use consistently and constantly to ensure that, you know, everyone, you can keep your ideas. You don't lose ideas. You have a content you want to write. Maybe next week, you can just write them down somewhere. 
then we have Google Calendar. So some of us, you know, we go to work and we need we need Calendar. Add it as something that you want to do. So it would remind you at a specific time you want to write. Then we have Stay Focused. So there are some of us that all right, writing, maybe on our PC, we get distracted by notifications, maybe like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and it just prevents you from writing and just being productive. So Stay Focused is an extension that helps you to, you can block those sites temporarily to avoid distractions, to avoid notifications, but it works as a Chrome extension. Then we have Microsoft To Do. To Do is actually a cloud based app that you can use to plan your task. Though, besides Microsoft To Do, you can use any To Do app that you find or you want on your mobile app. So, it's always advisable to plan your day, plan your week, plan your writings. If you know that, okay, you have other things you're doing maybe house chores, maybe work, and so that you have to do apps that list your tasks with time, so that something. Not that you say you want to write 2,000 words article maybe this week, and because you just didn't plan, you are actually you know, losing out. You can't want as you like. Now we'll talk about highlighting. So, when it comes to researching, I'm very sure some of us, we can open like 10 websites for us to read on a particular topic. Now, it can be very frustrating when you need to, you read something somewhere and you're like, oh, where did I see it? And you're like, oh my God, I, I didn't, I like this thing somewhere, I didn't keep this thing somewhere, and then I have to start checking each website one by one to find that particular content. And content is key to what you want to write about. Now, that's one usefulness of highlighting tools. And if some of us did the competition, GLASS was one of the highlighting tools. Now, for GLASS, you can highlight on PDFs, you can highlight on websites, and Glass provides a profile page for you to go back and see everything you highlighted. So we also have Weaver and website. The difference between Weaver and Glass is that with Weaver, you cannot um, get YouTube transcripts. I'm very sure if you've tried out Glass, you see that Glass provides an extension for you to get transcripts of YouTube videos, but Weaver doesn't provide that option. Next, we have Liner. In Liner, you can also highlight YouTube videos, you can highlight articles. And for Liner, it actually offers three subscriptions. For, so it depends between Liner and Glass is a Glass is free and provides a profile page for you to highlight on the web. For you to highlight agents tools. Now I'm very sure we know we are in the AI moving things fast. So we have some of this AI tools that we talk about. We have ChatGPT. As we all know, ChatGPT was developed by Open AI and it helps you to write articles. It will generate outlines based on topics and the prompts they give it. So before I continue, I would advise that you join the content only based on AI, or you ask AI to write a content for you and then copy and paste it into your blog. It's much advisable to just use it to be creative, use it to get ideas. Don't rely on AI tools. Then we have Gemini. Now this was formerly known as BAD, and Google developed Gemini to provide writing materials and resources. The difference between Gemini and ChatGPT is that Gemini will give you like the sources, it brought the information from, but that ChatGPT just you know, gives you everything. And sometimes the writing style is, can be different. Then we have Grammarly Go. So Grammarly Go is actually integrated with Grammarly for grammar. 
So quickly write content, maybe for your client emails, for your website, and for articles. So that's it about the technical writing tools. Any questions? Any questions so far? Can you hear me? Yes, Any we questions? can. Yeah, yes, I think we can. We are still processing it. Do we have any questions? Okay, so some, there's a question here for you. And Rose says, what tools are good for diagrams? Tools that are used for diagrams. I'm not yes, sure. You can use Microsoft Word if you want to create diagrams. You can use Microsoft Word to create diagrams. And you can also check. We can research and see if there are any more complex tools for diagrams. I can see some here. We have Lucy Charts. We have Miro, we have Smart Draw. So you can check out some of these tools and flowcharts. I think I've also seen Sketch. There's Microsoft Visual, yes. There's also Microsoft Visual. So you can check out some of these tools and see the interfaces and see if they are also free and see the ones that you like and you can use them. But draw.io, thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Yes, Adrian, let's see chat. So you can drop your questions, or you can unmute your mic if you have any questions. No questions? Someone is asking, does Medium support Markdown? Medium does not use Markdown. It mostly just uses text. So you can just add text based on what you want. What actually supports Markdown majorly is um, GitHub. Yes, GitHub. Hashnode supports Markdown as well. Yes, Ashley, thank you very much. Did someone raise their hand up? Cynthia? Cynthia. Yes, you can speak. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for the the class this evening. It was very insightful. Um, my question is um, on the plagiarism tools. Um, I think when you were talking about Qtex or something like that, you were talking about um, it helping you to know the, the maybe level of plagiarism in your in your writing, right? Yes. Uh, I remember? Okay. Okay. So you so you mentioned you said something about um, it can tell you if you have like thirty percent or forty percent. Um, plagiarism in your writing now my question yes. is when it comes to, when it comes to plagiarism and these tools uh what should you be what should you be aiming at in terms of the level of plagiarism in your writing what should you be aiming at because i don't know if it's possible to have zero percent when you're writing something i don't know i'm just just a thought i don't know Okay, so it's very possible to have zero percent in your writings. So it's most advisable that when you pick or when you research, when you find things online and you want to write in your own article, it's much advisable to write in your own words. So that way, you're not writing the exact words that they have in the articles. Now, if you notice that, let's say by chance, you still picked up their exact words and you notice the plagiarism, what I'll just say is just paraphrase it in your own words and in your own understanding. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Okay, Chudi, for social media, you mean LinkedIn? I know sure I get that question because you know, as a thinker writer, it's you can use YouTube, you can use LinkedIn, you can use Medium. YouTube would be in form of videos, videos, but when it comes to LinkedIn, yes, you can write articles on your newsletter as an article. I'm very sure some of us, when you research on some things, it would show you people's LinkedIn articles. Oh, all right, thank you. So I'm very sure you to show you LinkedIn articles. So some of the social media applications that are also like tools that you can use to show your writings or your social media applications like LinkedIn. So just ensure you use your LinkedIn as much as possible. Use Twitter, use, just showcase your work. So ensure that people know that this is what you do. Loud it, make noise, use these tools. Thank you. Any more questions? What publishing site is beginner friendly or someone that just started technical writing? So for publishing sites, Indian is very beginner friendly. Then we have Ashnode and we have Dev2. Medium is very easy, very, very easy. Then, how can you increase your ranking, your ranking for write up? That's when I mentioned the search engine optimization tools. So let me show you something. Let me just refresh my screen again. I use, I just installed keyword so far on my screen. I'm trying to my task for just a moment. So let's say I'm searching on technical writing tools. This is keyword so far right here. It would suggest keyword because it's free most times. It doesn't give information all the time. But with this keyword idea as you get here, it will, you can use some of these keywords and add them in your articles. Let me show you some. Google even shows you some of these keywords. Now this is it. Tenka writing tools. Tenka writing tools for students. Tenka tools list. Best AI for tech car writing. So these are some of the things that people search on. And when it comes to search engine optimization, you want to ensure that your website ranks, but you also want to give them accurate content based on their search intent. You can't just, imagine you going to a website and just seeing different kinds of words that are jumbled together. So it's advisable to just you know, use some of these things that people search on. These are keywords. The more you use them, the, the increased frequency in these keywords, the more they would rank. And that's why it's always advisable to use these SEO tools because they would give you more information on how to rank, how to make sure your website ranks. And when you go search engine optimization, search engine optimization is very broad. We have on page SEO, off page SEO, technical SEO. You have to ensure that even your website is fine. So there are a lot of things involved with that. So you're asking, can Medium be monetized in Nigeria? Yes, they have partner programs. You have to follow their policies to the end for you to be able to gain money on Medium. So any more questions? Yes, Richard. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Um, in terms of this SEO you're talking about, so how yes. do we use it in our technical writing? Now, you said something about, um, you showed something on Google, and you said we should use some of this, um, those um, searches. How do we use it in our article? Is it that we use, you said we should include it in our, um, in our writing. 
how do we include it because are we going to use it as subtopics all those things that we are seeing um those searches are we going to include them as subtopics in our article i want to know how okay. we can use it because you said something about it shouldn't be mumbled jumbled so that it's not like as if we are packing up so how do we include it all right so honestly search engine optimization is like a full topic on its own but i'll try to explain it so let's say that we want to write an article on technical writing tools now it doesn't necessarily have to be a subheading it can be a subheading and it can be uh it can be a subheading and it can also just be in the article itself and um, it's because keyword software is not giving us any more so let me just look for something let's search for javascript let's just search for javascript randomly I'm waiting for it to load. And this is it right here. All right. But can you see here? These are keyword ideas. No, it's your screen is not showing. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't sharing my screen. Sorry. So now I'm searching on JavaScript. I just searched on JavaScript. And keyword so far gives me these ideas for keywords that can rank. So if, if you're writing on JavaScript, it depends on what you are writing. The full topic. If you are writing, you a research, maybe a thousand article. JavaScript has appeared in a lot of things. And one thing I mentioned about search engine optimization is that when it comes to search engine optimization, we have what we call short keywords, middle keywords, or like like that. That is a short keyword, it's just keyword. But for something like this JavaScript, it's like a long keyword. So what JavaScript is a keyword that should be included in your article. We are explaining about JavaScript. So you should ensure that it's there, maybe as a subheading, or if I just in the article, if JavaScript, for example, and JavaScript is the short keyword, it will just be a sub edit. You will definitely put it in between the contents when you're talking about it. So, you understand. um yes so um i think the network didn't let me hear you so well so sorry the network was really bad I think you are having troubles with her network. Okay, so it's not from my end. Okay. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. Because I didn't I didn't hear the answer she gave. And I really wanted to hear it. She has left the call and I think she'll be joining. She'll be trying to join anytime soon. I'm sorry, it's not okay. Thank you. Okay. I didn't hear what you said at all. I didn't even hear your answer at all. Yeah. Okay, so 
Let me think it again. All right. Let me share my screen. Okay, so you asked about search engine optimization and you said, how do we use it so that it's not mumbo jumbled? And we do use it as a subheading. So what I said was, for example, I search on JavaScript and you want to write about JavaScript. When it comes to search engine optimization, we have what we call a short tail keyword and a long tail keyword. An example of a short tail keyword is JavaScript because it's just a word. A long tail keyword is like, what is JavaScript? How to use JavaScript? Something like this. What is JavaScript used for? How do I install JavaScript? Things like that. Some of these long tail keywords can form as your subheadings, fine. But it's not composite that it must be the subheadings. And it can also be added in between your content. So, keywords of, for example, here gives us keyword ideas. Now, Another long tail keyword is what is JavaScript. So let's say we are talking about JavaScript, the official documentation for, I think, Firefox. So you can start and ensure that in a 2000 word article, for example, JavaScript, you talking about JavaScript and listing and mentioning JavaScript in that article should be nothing less than 10 times in that article. You are not, you are actually, creating quality content, but you're also ensuring that you are using these keywords that people would search on. Like, because when people are searching for something on the website, on Google's website, they have what we call a search intent. We all have a search intent. You are looking for something online because you want to get information. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You are looking for something online because Search you want to like get information. But you actually still want to ensure that, you know, you are using these keywords and your content ranks. So you would create quality content and create your outline saying JavaScript, what is JavaScript? This is JavaScript. What is JavaScript? This is of JavaScript and many more. So when you are writing something like uses of JavaScript, you can now add it under the subheading and say, what is JavaScript used for? JavaScript is used for this, number one, to create websites, number two, and many more like that. Just ensure that you use it while still creating quality content. So that's the answer. You understand? Yes, I do. I do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any more questions? So even though it's already nine o'clock. <laughs> Any more questions? None. Seems you don't have any more questions. Thank you very much. It was nice, you know, teaching you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Victoria, for the insightful section. So, per adventure, we have any more questions, please, you can just drop them on the cohort three chat so everyone else could benefit from the question, like how we all benefited from the SEO question. So, if you have any more questions, just drop them on the chat and they will be attended to by mentors and your fellow mentees. So, thank you so much. Excuse for... me. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay, merci. Please, this our assignment. TV is tomorrow that is going yes, to end tomorrow. by eleven fifty nine p.m. Yes, right? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. It's nice doing business with you. Wow. Okay. So yes. Um. Good night, everyone. Have a blissful night. And don't forget to share. Someone wants to submit the assignment by 11.58. Yes, yes. Deadline. Deadline. Bye.
thank you so very much, my Victoria. Thank you. Thank you.